Good evening and welcome to the fifth lecture of our online lecture series, Scientifically Speaking, an hour of knowledge sharing and interaction with a world expert designed just for you. I'm Rashmi, a third year student at Ashoka University majoring in physics. Studying physics at Ashoka University has been an exciting experience for me. I am, I am a member of the founding physics batch and the great thing about being part of a relatively new department is that you can be a part of the beginning of many new initiatives. Uh, my friends and I started the astronomy club on campus a couple of years ago. We wrote a proposal for a telescope which was approved and we've been using the telescope which we've fondly named Zoom ever since. So one of the nice things about science at Ashoka is that student led projects and initiatives are very much encouraged and supported. Our aim with the Scientifically Speaking series is to, is to introduce you to cutting edge research and innovative teaching techniques. We have a new topic and expert every time you join us and we go on a journey together to explore a subject area from the perspective of data and science. Before I introduce our speaker today, just a few logistics for this lecture. I will, inter I will interview the speaker for about 30 minutes during which um, you can ask questions using the Q&A feature on Zoom. You can choose to share your name or send in your questions anonymously. All seminars are recorded and will be uploaded on the uh, Ashoka University YouTube page for those of you who may have missed it or wish to re revisit it at a later date. Lastly, there will be a quiz to test your knowledge after this lecture. The top five winners will get a special gift. Let us now welcome Professor Debayan Gupta. Professor Gupta is currently an assistant professor of computer science at Ashoka University, where he teaches courses on security, privacy, and introductory programming. He earned his PhD from Yale University and a bachelor's degree from St. Xavier's College, Kolkata. He is also a visiting professor and research affiliate at MIT, where he was previously a faculty member. His primary areas of interest are secure computation and cryptography. Hi, Professor, how are you doing? Hi, Rashmi, thank you so much for having me. Um, sir, so since many of our viewers are young high school students who are um, hoping to decide what to study in college, could you perhaps tell us what got you interested in cryptography? So my entry into both computer science and cryptography, frankly, included a lot of uh, lucky or unlucky events, uh, depending on the way you look at it. Uh, but I think cryptography specifically as a topic interested me for two reasons. One sort of the formal one uh, and one real reason. The formal reason was more along the lines of uh, the stuff along uh, around the Snowden affair was actually happening for quite a while. So I had, I was in the area, so to speak, and I had a deep, relatively deeper insight into what was really going on at the time. And that got me really interested uh, because I saw this, uh, these techniques being misused essentially. And the other reason, which is the real reason, was frankly because it was cool and I like shiny stuff. It's also one of the few areas, and I love to joke about this, uh, where if you don't know the answer to a question, you can just answer with something like, I'm sorry, I'm not at liberty to say, and it makes <laughs> it very clever and important. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Um, so I'm sure our audience is looking forward to hearing from you on today's topic. I mean, it is a topic that is pertinent to everybody today in a world that is um, so dominated by information and social media platforms. So um, to dive right in, let's start with, uh, with cryptography and perhaps its historical context. So what could you tell us about that? So let me just start by sharing my screen and uh... What I'm going to do first is what all professors do when they're asked a question by a student is instead of answering the actual question, we deconstruct the question itself, right? Uh, and you asked a question, they're saying, uh, can you tell us about sort of the history of cryptography essentially? Um, what I want to do first is really uh, break down what cryptography is, right? Because those of you who already know the term and those of you who Googled it will both get this sort of idea that cryptography has, to, has something to do with code breaking and advanced mathematics and all of this other stuff. It really isn't. Um, cryptography is really, as far as I'm concerned, um, all about controlling the flow of information, right? Um, it's like, I, I have a toy example up, which is, you know, you're organizing a birthday party, which is, obviously why you're wearing a cowboy hat. Um, 
but you're organizing a birthday party and you tell them that when uh, I say velociraptors, which actually is a bad word because it comes up in almost every conversation I have. But anyway, um, when I mention the word velociraptors, you bring in the cake. And what this is doing is it's a signaling system. Everyone else hears a normal conversation. Everyone else hears why. While the people you have chosen hear something else. They hear I should bring in the cake, right? Um, so cryptography at the end of the day is really about controlling the flow of information and the dissemination of it, right? Um, and that naturally leads uh, to a much deeper understanding of this field once, once you get that basic idea. Because it's no longer about who understood mathematics to a certain level, right? If you go back in history, at any point in time, whenever you had power, uh, and remember, you know, the, the, the proverb knowledge is power is actually very much true, right? Mm -hmm. um, whenever you had a power or you had a hierarchy, you had mechanisms imposed by the rulers of that hierarchy to control the dissemination of information, right? They didn't want everyone to know what they knew. And this was especially true, of course, of royalty and militaries, but it was also true of religions. So whenever you had this kind of power, they tried to control the flow of information and this led to cryptography being developed across the world. You name a civilization and I can talk about it. So, uh, you know, ancient Sumer, uh, they had like the Sumeria, they had cuneiform tablets, uh, the Egyptians had hieroglyphics, not just normal hier hieroglyphics, they had secret hieroglyphics, which is like, okay, secret on top of secret, wow. Um, you had the Atbash cipher, um, the Caesar cipher is still used as a toy thing. It's pretty simple. It's like when you have uh, a Caesar cipher of size two, for example, would change A into C, B into D and so on, right? So you're taking each letter and you're just adding a number to it. And there are many, many other measures. So you see that uh, uh, rod with a piece of paper wrapped around it uh, on the bottom. Uh, here's sort of my MS Paint version of this. Um, and the idea is, unless you have a rod of exactly the correct diameter, um, you can't reconstruct the actual message. And we do this all the time, right? School children, you, you must have done this thing where you sort of fold up a paper and you write a message on top of it. And when you unfold it, it looks like a bunch of garbage until you fold it back in exactly the right way. Now, just to be clear, this sort of technique is not the only way in which information was controlled, right? You had like just blunt force you had language, many, many religions restricted the languages in which uh, their holy books could be written or uh, you know, communicated. If you owned a, a copy of your holy book in the wrong language or even said words from it, you could get persecuted across religions, right? Um, so wherever you had power, you had control over information and therefore the development of cryptography. Um, one of my favorites actually is uh, from India, which is, if you read the Kama Sutra, one of the, uh, I think there's 64 arcs of the woman, and one of them, don't quote me on this, I think it's arc number 44, uh, I don't remember exactly, pretty sure it's 44. One of the arcs is cryptography, um, which is each woman needs to know cryptography, they assume women were good at math, um, in order to communicate with her lovers with the rest of, without the rest of society getting in the way. And uh, some of these techniques were fairly complex. We're not talking something as simple as what we've discussed up to now. Um, these were detailed in the Jamangala Kabya around six, 700 years ago, but you have older versions of these also. And they had all sorts of techniques from simple mathematical techniques to ones that used uh, essentially uh, geometry, like shapes to convey extra information. So instead of saying a circle, you would say that which is shaped like the sun. Uh, in your message. And unless you knew looking at the sun is sort of, you see a circle, you wouldn't know that. The idea, of course, is that one's lover would have more auxiliary information of this sort than anyone else would. And therefore, the messages were secure. And there were many mechanisms thereof. Of course, where this really, really got its power, where people really started using uh, cryptography, was in the modern world. So this is a slightly more modern version of the Kama Sutra cipher thing. This is someone on a confessions page trying to communicate with someone they have a crush on. 
uh, and they're releasing uh, a, a, a hash, a sort of one way or trapdoor function for those of you who know what that is, but essentially trying to use cryptography to tell their crush, I like you, while no one else knows who they are unless certain conditions are met. So this continues to this day. But of course, many of you have seen the imitation game and you probably already know what the main area of cryptographic usage is, uh, militaries. Right. Um, and the reason for this is kind of obvious, right? You know, uh, for everything else in life, we have legal systems. Uh, if you want to protect information, you can copyright it or do something like that. The problem with that is that our legal system is retributive, not preventative. A law against murder doesn't prevent murder. Sure murderers uh, are punished. Now, the problem with that is that, well, if I'm just making this up. If the Indian military steals information from the Russian military, um, the Indian military can't exactly go and then sort of complain about it, right? They can't say, oh, we want some, uh, we, 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 we are going to steal the Russian military or something of that sort. Right? Um, so they can't do that. They, they need something that's preventative, right? And the only real preventative system that we have is of course uh, something like uh, a cyber. Sorry, I think there's some sort of noise coming. I don't think it's from my end. Oh, so you're muted. Sorry, I was just checking to see if it was from my end, but uh, I'm just going to ignore the noise and move. Yeah. But uh, so we we have uh, the militaries of the world, of course, created a lot of these techniques. And if you look back in history, pretty much every major historical figure of power. So for example, the thing you see on the right is called a Jefferson cylinder. And you can imagine which Jefferson made that obviously. Um, and uh, pretty much every figure of power uh, designed their own methods of controlling information very often in the form of some kind of cryptography in order to communicate with their chosen people, so to speak. Right. So, so at this point, let me ask you, um, our world today is so different from the times of the world war that you've just spoken of. Nowadays, we're hearing a lot of people um, cautioning us against sharing our data on social media platforms or with apps. So I can understand why, say, the military would be uh, very concerned about data security and privacy. But as, as lay people who, so, I mean, we say we have nothing to hide. I mean, why should we care? <laughs> so that's a really great question. Uh... Let me put it this way. How do you know when something has value, right? One of the easiest way to do this, one of the easiest methods is check the black market, right? If you look at the black market and something has value, it sells for real money, uh, you know it has worth. And as you can see, depending on what kind of data is stolen about you, uh, it's worth a great deal of money. And that immediately tells you, wait, this money isn't coming from nowhere, right? So if criminals are paying money for this, at the end of the day, somehow they're hurting you, clearly, right? So for example, in the case of medical records, the reason people want your medical records uh, is mainly because uh, insurance companies use a lot of techniques to flag bad transactions. And one of the ways in which your medical record might be uh, used is they check, oh, you have a leg that was broken six months ago. So it's not very strange if you buy a crutch. So they'll make a fake insurance claim on a crutch or something, uh, and they'll make man money off of that while your insurance company won't flag that. And eventually the cost of your insurance goes up because of this sort of thing. Um, now, uh, this, this, this crutch thing, by the way, isn't a made up thing. Uh, a group of people, I, I can't sort of give you more details about it, but there, were, there was a bunch of them that were caught uh, operating out of a gas station near Boston. Um, and the FBI caught them doing exactly this. Uh, they were selling thousands of crutches each day from stolen medical records. Similarly, all of these other systems can be exploited, usually at your expense, if not at the expense of your government, to gain money for criminals. And that immediately should tell you why your data is important, because it's worth some money. The way I see it, if it's worth money and it's being used, shouldn't I get a cut of it? You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, the second reason is something else. Um, 
I'm going to actually disobey one of my cardinal rules and I'm going to read out something that's on a slide. Uh, this is a quotation. This is a quote by Eric Schmidt, who really oversaw the growth of Google uh, from 2000 onwards. He still holds a powerful position at Alphabet, um, but sort of from 2000 to 2017, he basically ran Google and Alphabet, right? Um, very powerful man. This is what he said. With your permission, you give us more information about you, about your friends, and we can improve the quality of our searches. That sounds nice. We can improve the quality of our searches. But then he says, we don't need you to type it all. We know where you are. We know where you've been. We can more or less know what you're thinking about. Right? Now, if that doesn't give you 1984 flashbacks, I, I don't think we're on the same page. All right? Um, What's really scary about this, of course, is that he said this in 2010, a decade ago. And right now I can guarantee you that that more or less know what you're thinking about has become, we almost certainly know what you're thinking about. Um, they, they have your movement patterns. They have a detailed profile of you. Remember, these companies make money off of building your profile. They have thousands, tens of thousands of the most talented computer programmers in the world dedicated to deriving methods uh, which will copy your logical processes, which are designed to profile you and understand how you think so that they can exploit your very thoughts to make more money, right? That's what they're doing. Um, so if you're willing to give them even more data, I, you know, that, that's, that's a moral question that you need to ask yourself, right? Um, now, beyond that, uh, you, you said something very interesting in, when you talked about militaries, right? Mm -hmm. You said that, you know, militaries care about security and privacy. Why should we as laypersons? Now, I very quickly want to separate out uh, security and privacy. These are really not the same thing. Uh, I didn't find this cartoon. One of the scientifically speaking team did, but I love it. Um, I really want you to understand that privacy and security are two completely different concepts. They are sometimes interlinked, but not always. And very often what happens is that uh, your privacy can be broken even if your security isn't. Your privacy can be broken in legal ways, right? So imagine you go to a doctor and the doctor keeps your medical records and, they, and he or she locks it in a cabinet. Now, if someone breaks into that cabinet, uh, the security, the doctor's security has been breached and then your privacy has also been breached. On the other hand, if a person comes in with a warrant and just the doctor unlocks that cabinet for them and then they, they're supposed to take one record but they take the others, they take your record also, um, your privacy has been breached but at no point has security been broken. All the mechanisms have, have worked as they should have. So it's really important to understand that privacy and security require very different amounts of engagement from civic society and very different types of regulation. And there are all sorts of visible versus invisible dangers uh, and threats. Usually what happens is security threats are very visible. Privacy threats are often less so because people uh, often think, oh, I have nothing to hide. And that's obviously yeah. garbage. Everyone has something to hide. Like uh, for most of you listening, how would you feel if I said, okay, let's publish your browsing history, right? Um, the nothing to hide, that's a really nice statement, but it's not a complete question. Nothing to hide from whom? And if you say the government, remember the government isn't a monolithic entity. It's made up of lots of people and some of those people may not be very nice. So whenever you're thinking of the nothing to hide argument, make sure you finish that question, nothing to hide from whom. Um, well, this illustration is actually very interesting because there seem to be a limited number of planks and these workers seem to have a choice as to where the plank goes. Does it go to building security or to privacy? So is that a choice that we have in real life? That's a really great question. Um, the answer is yes and no. It used to be the case. It's also uh, somewhat of a money spent issue for every rupee spent. You can spend it on X or Y. Um, but the reality of the situation is it turns out that modern cryptography actually allows us to do a lot of very interesting things. And I apologize for the algebraic notations on the slide, but I'm told these are 11 and 12 students. 
listing in, so we should be able to handle this. Um, so let's take that medical doctor example that we spoke about, right? Um, in that story, there are only two parties. Let's call, call them X1 and X2, right? Uh, sorry, P1 and P2. And you have secret information X1, which is your symptoms, and you want to keep those private. And the medical doctor has her expertise and her logic about how she uses those symptoms to understand your, to diagnose you and understand your condition. And what you want to do is get a diagnosis. So uh, you have X1, your doctor has X2, and together you want to compute a diagnosis Y using X1 and X2. And in our story, what we're saying is perhaps those pieces of data are private, right? You don't want to share them with everyone. And this is something, this what I've drawn out is just a more generalized form of this, where you have N parties, one through N, and all of them have a secret or private value, X1, X2 through Xn. And together, they want to compute a function on top of all of this, right? This is just a general form of that statement. And we'll look at some examples of this so that we can make it clearer later. Um, so it turns out, that you can actually do this while preserving privacy. And that's one of the greatest achievements of modern cryptography. You know, we, we're, very, we're already really good at sort of locking things in boxes, right? We're already really good at taking something, saying, oh, I'll encrypt this with a password. And only people with that password will be able to sort of take it out. Mm -hmm. um, what we're not, what we weren't so good at was using that stuff, right? Once you lock something in a box, how do you use that thing? Right? You can say, I take my symptoms, I lock it using a password, fine, but you need to give it to your medical doctor. Otherwise, how can they diagnose you? Does that make sense? Um, but it turns out that intuition may not actually be true. So let me give you an example of this. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about sort of two ways to solve the same problem. And one I'll say verbally, and one I'll try to illustrate with a nifty little animation, which the team spent all of us spent far too much time on. Um, so the example is as follows. Imagine you and I and a bunch of other people are in a room and we want to compute our average salary. And uh, of course, nobody wants to give out their salary because as you well know, that's private information. Um, so how do we do this? Now, uh, in many cases, what's going to happen is uh, if you give this problem to a child as a riddle, they'll come up very quickly with uh, what's called the calculator solution to this. And so you take a calculator, you type in your salary, you add a big random number. You give it to me, I add in my salary, and I, I add a big random number, and so on. Everyone adds in their salary and a big random number. In the second round, each of us subtracts off the big random number, right? And at the end of these two rounds, what do we have left on the calculator? We simply have the sum of everyone's salaries. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you can immediately compute the average without, notice you never actually reveal what any individual salary is. So this sort of thing can be done. Here's another way of doing it. And you'll see why we did it, why this other way is important in a moment. So let's say there are three parties, P1, P2, and P3. And uh, P1 has a salary of 107 rupees, P2 has 105, and P3 has 88. And they want to compute their average salary. So the, in the first step, they each split their salaries into three parts, right? So the sum, so 25 plus 92 minus 10 for P1 adds up to 107, all right? So they just split up their salaries. Then what they do is each of these three parts is sent to the three parties. So you can imagine... P1 sending a uh, minus 10 to itself, right? Uh, 25 is sent to P3 and 92 to P2. Does that make sense? So it just takes its salary, splits it into three parts, and it sends the three parts to the three different people, including itself. The other two parties do exactly the same thing, right? They split their salaries and they send the three parts to the three people. Then each party individually adds up its individual or everything it's received. So what it received from itself and the other two parties, each of the parties does this, and then they get a number. These numbers seem random, except notice 
if they now share all of these numbers, the sums of all of these are going to be the sum of everyone's salaries, right? Because all we've done is sum the salaries up in a different way. At that point, you just divide by three and you get the average salary, right? Um, this is just a slightly different way of doing the same thing. Why is this important? Well, think about what you would have done in a normal world if you didn't think about all the cryptography thing images, right? Um, you would just pick someone, a trusted third party. Uh, you just give, uh, everyone would just give their salaries to this person and they would just compute the average, right? Um, and here, notice how the communication occurs. It's fairly straightforward. It's one-to-one, -one, right? This is what we would call a client-server model, right? There's one server, and that person serves everyone. This is what's very common across the internet. Now, what's interesting is, uh, in, in this story that I told you about computing averages, uh, Sure, that's cute, but like, what if we want to compute something other than the average, right? So it turns out what we did was essentially addition, right? Um, it turns out if you can do addition and multiplication, the moment you can come up with a system that can handle both, you can do anything. You can create an arbitrary function. And, and it, it, it doesn't sound like much, we'll get into what that means later. But you can just, for those of you who know a little bit of computer science, you can build a NAND gate, which is a universal gate, which means you can compute anything securely. Mm -hmm. And uh, that has a repercussion. You noticed when we did that two round calculator thing where you, you needed to send it around in two circles. Uh, and of course, in the three party thing, everybody needed to send everything to everyone else, right? And generally speaking, when you're computing things securely with uh, addition and multiplication, everyone needs to send messages to everyone else. And that, as you can tell, looks really complex. There's a lot of communication occurring, which is not good, right? But it turns out there's a middle ground. So let's talk about that salary situation one more time. And in here, what happens is you have all of these parties that want to compute their average salary. Imagine there are four people with four bowls in the middle. And what you do is you take your salary, you split it up into four equal, not equal parts, you split it up into four integers, let's say, that happen to add up to your salary. And you write it down on four separate pieces of paper and you put it in, put each piece of paper in one of the four bowls, right? And each of the people in charge of the bowls simply adds up all the pieces of paper they've received and publishes the total. And obviously, similarly, the sum of the total will be the sum of your salaries. And here you can see the number of lines obviously is much fewer than the earlier case, right? Um, that means less communication and less uh, latency. That's less time spent doing stuff, right? And as long as even a single person among those four red things in the middle uh, remains honest, you can be sure that your salary will never ever be revealed as long as even a single person remains honest. Right. Yeah, this seems a lot cleaner and also a lot less daunting as the previous diagram that you just showed. Um, but anyways, just looking at this diagram for a bit, it seems to be that even if one person vanishes for some reason, I mean, say their laptop dies or burns um, for some reason, it, it seems like everything sort of falls apart because now you have one person missing and their information is also lost now. So. It seems like a fragile system. Is there any way around this? That's great. So you've immediately spotted the problem, right? What we need in this sort of environment is some kind of redundancy, right? right? We need some way of making sure that, you know, if a server drops out, uh, we want to be able to handle, let's say something like, you know, four out of eight servers. So as long as any four out of the eight come together, we can get our solution. That's what we want, right? Now, what we were doing, uh, sort of is very similar to what happens in many places where you require security in real life. You must have seen all these movies, you know, where to launch a missile, multiple people need to turn keys at the same time or something like that. Uh, you've seen stuff like this in boardrooms as well, right? You need seven out of 20 executives need to agree before an action can be taken, right? Um, now, what we were doing until now was doing it really badly, right? Uh, what we were doing is we had something, a secret, 
which we were splitting up among four parties in a really stupid way. We were just saying, oh, when you have, when all four of them are added up, then you can recover the secret. Does that make sense? Uh, and if any four of them drop out, we're in deep trouble, right? That's essentially what we were doing. What we need is some way to have a key out of N secret sharing. Instead of taking our secret password and breaking it up into four parts such that all four parts are important, what we need is, I'm going to split it up into, I'm just making this up, 10 parts, and any two of those 10 can be brought together to recreate the secret, or any six of those 10, or something like that. We need to be able to control that. How do we do this? Well, it turns out this is remarkably simple. Um, something called Shamir secret sharing, and uh, I'm going to harken back to class six or seven geometry to do this. When you learn about lines in geometry, uh, straight lines. Um, I don't know, actually, grade five, maybe. Okay, Six. that's good. Then I can use this. I'm assuming class <laughs> 11 and 12 people know what straight lines I'm are. Pretty sure. All right. Um, so a straight line uh, has an equation y equals mx plus c. That's not super important. Um, what's important to remember is that if you have a single point, there are an infinite number of straight lines you can draw through it. Right? However, the moment you have two points, there's only a single line you can draw through it. So imagine this case. Let's say I have a secret. Let's say we take that secret as 35. Let's say that's our integer secret. Uh, those of you who know how the equation works know that 35 will be that C value. Okay. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to make sure the point at which the line cuts our Y axis, the vertical axis, that's what we call the secret. All right. So that's the C in the equation. And now what we do is we take this line and we take 50 random points on it. And we distribute this to 50 different people. Any one of those people just has a single point and therefore has an infinite number of lines. They can't possibly figure out what that C was. But the moment any two people get together, they can just draw that line, right? And then they can immediately recover that point C right? Uh, that value C, I should say. Now, if you want something more complicated, you want to say, oh, we want three out of five or three out of something. Um, that's super easy, right? Um, it's not really a parabola. Anything with an X squared term actually just works. Um, so what you want to do is whatever the number of uh, people you need to come together, uh, you set the order of your equation accordingly. So if you have an X in your, uh, if X is the largest order in your system, what does that mean? You need, you, you just need any two points to recover it. If you have an X squared, you need three points and so on and so forth, right? And now you can do K out of N secret sharing. You just decide what order of polynomial you want and you can share secrets in this way. And this, of course, is a really, really powerful technique. And you can actually compute on these things in various ways. You can multiply these points together and stuff like that. Uh, there are all sorts of interesting things you can do. Uh, those of you who have heard of uh, FFT, Fourier Transform, if you're, since you're in physics uh, and stuff, yeah. I'll assume you do, uh, you can already see how those kinds of techniques could become really useful in uh, these kinds of scenarios when you're dealing with these polynomials to get really fast computation. And uh, this can be used for all sorts of interesting applications. So this is something a friend of mine and I built some time ago. Uh, we called it Friend Finder. Um, of course, this was sort of too heavy duty for friends to use. But the idea is there's a bunch of people with this app. However, every single person uh, has a private location. You don't want to give away your current location, right? Uh, so therefore, what you do uh, but you also want to find out if you're too close to someone else. Let's say if you're within 100 meters of a friend, you want this app to ping you and say, hey, you, a friend is nearby or nobody is near. But nobody wants to reveal what their actual locations are. Uh, so this is actually being used. This kind of technology is actually being used for satellites right now. Because you know sometimes multiple spy satellites want to spy on the same location and stuff. Yeah. Um, and they, they don't want, it's very, really embarrassing if they come close, too close to each other and stuff like that. Uh, so it's pretty useful tech. Yeah. 
So are there any other um, practical applications you can tell us about this? I mean, is it just satellites or other things too? <laughs> Sure. So, uh, no, this applies to any sort of situation. So remember the medical doctor thing I said, um, any kind of situation of that sort where you have private data and you want to get someone else to process it, uh, it works for that kind of scenario, right? Um, and it's really counterintuitive, right? That's what the second bullet point sort of tries to highlight. So think about paying your taxes, right? Uh, let's say you have a lot of details about how different parts of your salary, your HRA and stuff like that. And you need to give it to a, to a tax expert so they can compute on it and decide what to do about your taxes. Uh, but normally you would need to reveal your taxation details to them. Uh, but now you don't need to. Uh, you can have auctions and tenders done in this way where you don't need to trust uh, a third party to do it. But let me actually give you an example that might be sort of closer to your heart. Imagine a simple case. You want to get from point A to point B. Right? You want to use Google Maps mapping data uh, to find out what is the best way to get from point A to point B. However, you do not want to tell Google what points A and B are. Sounds really counterintuitive. How can Google tell me what the best path is from A to B if I never reveal to Google what A and B are? That seems completely ridiculous. But think back to what we just argued. We said, you can compute an arbitrary function without revealing the internal values. So think about it. Your X, your secret is A and B, your locations. Google's secret data, in this case, is their traffic information. And together, you can compute without revealing anything the best path between A and B. That's actually exactly the sort of thing that becomes possible. And right now, for example, uh, you can imagine, I can't give you too many details about it again. Uh, let's say US military in Syria, um, they're cooperating to some extent with a lot of local militants, right? Um, now, they don't want to give the militants their exact positions because, you know, they don't trust them so much. But they also want to know if they get too close so they don't die of friendly fire and stuff like that. And they also want to work out different routes so that routes don't overlap ahead of time. So that sort of technology is actually being used for such cases. Now, uh, let me quickly give you a simple example of this. Um, this was something that happened about a decade or so ago. Um, there were a group of uh, bandits and they were caught using uh, the NSA's co-traveler program, which was highly privacy invasive. So let me give you a little bit of details. There were a lot of bank robberies and they had the same MO. They were hitting rural banks near closing time. Um, and the way the FBI caught them was they asked for cell tower dumps. They, uh, they just asked all the cell phone towers near these places uh, and they just did a set intersection. They just found all the cell phones nearby, um, which were about one and a half lakh. And that of course is not very good because we've seen in the past that when this kind of data gets out to law enforcement, remember again, like governments, uh, law enforcement is not a monolith, right? They're made up of lots of individuals. And what invariably happens in these cases is that policemen or whoever has access to this data end up looking up their ex-wives or using it for blackmail, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, now, we now have better methods, which are actually being used in many cases. Uh, the Estonian government uses these techniques already. Uh, they're, they're, the government of Denmark, I think, is using it for some stuff also. Um, and in, in those scenarios, you never need to reveal any private information. You use these kinds of techniques. So when the governments of the world are telling you, we need you to reveal private information in order to get X, Y, Z done, it turns out we have these techniques in place that allow us to do that and allow us to do it really efficiently also. We're actually right now less than an order of magnitude away from normal computation in many cases. And an order of magnitude is nothing, right? That's just a couple of years of development, right? So anything that you could do two, three years ago, you can do pretty much in real time right now while preserving your privacy, which is a really powerful thing. Uh, that's pretty much it for me. Um, these are the places where we stole the images from in case people are interested. 
Um, and of course, uh, thank you, Rashmi, for asking those wonderfully incisive questions. Oh, thank you, sir. It's been a very good session so far. And this was my first introduction, actually, to uh, cryptography. So for me, it's been particularly interesting. Um, so let's actually move on to the Q&A now. Um, since many of you have similar questions, I will try and find common themes and address them first. We do have limited time, but I will try and address as many of your questions as we can. I mean, sorry, Professor will try and address as many of your questions as he can. Um, so our first question is from uh, Deepro Chakravarti. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. He asks, um, what is the difference between encryption and cryptography? So cryptography is the whole field, right? Encryption is a particular act you perform in that field, right? You can think of it as physics being a field, right? Um, and let's say uh, engineering a bridge or understanding, doing something with fluid dynamics, a particular act within the field is encryption, right? Uh, cryptography is really about understanding all of these processes in general. So for example, the particular thing that we did with the adding numbers together, right? Um, that's cryptography, but it's really hard to tell someone that that's encryption, right? Encryption in general means an act of taking a piece of information and usually using a secret key of some sort to obfuscate it so that anyone else who does not have that secret key cannot get back the original piece of information. Right. Um, the next question is from Ayushi Malik and she asks, do we need to know coding to be able to do cryptography? Is that a skill that can be learned by ourselves? And if yes, how? So cryptography is like any other large field. It's that that's very much like asking can I learn astronomy on my own? So the answer is both yes and no, of course. Uh, you can learn it on your own, but the best way to do it, of course, is go to college and learn it. Um, there are also many good online courses available uh, on these topics, but like with any field, it takes a long time to get good at it. Right. Um, so Deepro Chakravarti again asks about um, secret sharing using points. He says, even if as little as two servers for a line lose their honesty, the data is compromised. So how do we get around this? So of course, there is a balance between how much redundancy you want uh, and how many servers need to get together to rebuild your data, right? Um, so that's the balance. So you, know, you usually have something like five servers need to get together. And what you usually, again, try to do is to give these servers to mutually untrusting people. So let's say what you might want to do is give one server to the judiciary, uh, give one server to the Lokpal, give one server to a rotating group of NGOs, and so on and so forth. So the idea is that all three of them colluding is an unlikely circumstance, right? right. Um, so you, you want some balance there. Right, I see. Um, Right. Our next question is from an anonymous person and they ask, the centralization of power is present in the COVID-19 era, especially with um, the compulsion of Arogya Setu app by the, uh, by the central government. So how can one ensure privacy along with their safety? And uh, Rochan also asked, I think, along a similar line, um, if we consider that we have already shared our data with the government by linking everything to Aadhaar, is there any way we can still have our privacy? So the answer is yes. So first of all, uh, Aadhaar, I have very mixed feelings about it because I, I know for a fact that many of the people working on Aadhaar have very much the best of intentions. And there are actually very strong regulations around the use of Aadhaar data. So it's not like the government can just read that data and use it willy-nilly. Um, but there are many other ways. Actually, Aadhaar is a bacha. Like that's really not the way the government gets information on you. There are many other mechanisms. But I understand the general thrust of the question, right? Our privacy is already gone. Right. But that doesn't mean you stop fighting for it, right? What we need to get, in order to get good privacy, what we need is a lot of civilian, civic engagement. And that's currently not there, right? Where we, we like sharing stuff so much, we, we just give everything away, essentially for free to governments and other entities who very often don't use it for very nice purposes. Right. Um, so I think once we have the right amount of civic engagement, 
uh, we can have stronger regulation in the future so that the future data you produce does get protected. And maybe we can force the governments and other institutions of the world to start deleting some of the older data. Though I, 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 I have some cynicism about that, you know, what, what's already out is out. There's not very much you can do, but you can protect yourself perhaps in the future. Right, I see. So um, along a similar vein, um, Srija Raj asks, has government oversight made the idea of privacy obsolete? And he says he asks this in light of the fact that Tor servers are run by the NSA. <laughs> so uh, there, there, there's two, three parts to this. So first of all, um, the answer is no. Uh, the governments of the world, while they have a lot of information and all this stuff, um, I hate saying this in a medium that will be recorded, they're also quite incompetent in a lot of ways. Um, I, don't get me started on the NSA. Like there, there's so much stupid stuff going on there. Um, like th they were using a broken version of Red Hat to run, I think some of their umbrella programs and then hackers got, it's, it's just really bad. Um, they were sharing their passwords around and you know, Barack Obama, I think was trying to spy on Ban Ki-moon of all people. I don't know why and that oh. got leaked. So it, it's really not, th these are not sort of the ace James Bond type spies you're imagining, <laughs> right? These are more like your standard government bureaucrats and they're, they're kind of too incompetent to actually do that much damage. What they can do is they can cause a lot of focus damage. If they hate you personally, they can really go after you. Um, the NSA managing Tor servers is actually, so that's actually managed by a certain branch of the US Navy, uh, as it turns out. And uh, there are all sorts of protections on it. It so happens that I, I know a bunch of the people who worked on this stuff. Um, they don't actually have that much control over it. The people who actually work in these systems are fairly well insulated from the NSA's direct meddling. So yes, the governments of the world have a lot of information, but all is not lost. And I think it's really important to build a lot of civic engagement so that we can have laws in the future. Uh, I mean, GDPR was a good first step. It has its flaws, but it was a good first step towards something like that. Uh, India's Sri Krishna Commission has also got some good ideas. Again, I'm not saying there aren't flaws, but the very fact that these things are happening are a good sign. Okay. So um, Dulal Paul asks an interesting question. Um, how can we know if our security or privacy has been breached? Oh, uh, so as far as security is concerned, uh, there's a bunch of websites as like haveibeenpawned.com and stuff like that. Uh, the Mozilla Fire Firefox, uh, so Mo the Mozilla Foundation, which runs Firefox, for example, also runs something like that. I believe it's called the Firefox Monitor. And you can enter your emails and stuff in there, and they will check whether your, you know, your security has been breached in some way. Um, as far as your privacy is concerned, um, it's really hard to know. In, in many cases, you only find out later. And... Uh, in many, many of these cases right now, th there's unfortunately not too much you can do about it because there are actually so-called legal means, and I say so-called because I don't agree with the laws involved, that allow uh, companies and governments to breach your privacy in various ways. And some of these, yes, have to do with the Indian government, but many more have to do with other governments around the world. And many more have to do with the fact that, you know, the internet doesn't really care about borders, so uh, the, the discrepancies between the laws of different countries allows companies to get away with a lot of stuff. I mean, that is quite terrifying. And especially for most of us, we, I mean, we're new to computer science. Some of us know very little about it. And we feel, I mean, sort of handicapped, right? Because I mean, what do you do about something like this? Um, yeah, it's pretty terrifying. Um, so uh, for our next question, an anonymous person- The answer to that is pay me more money. <laughs> yeah, we should keep that in mind. Um, right, so our next question is from an anonymous person and they ask, um, how much can we trust e-wallets like um, Paytm and UPI? Uh, so I'm going to do the same thing I did with the nothing to hide question. I'm going to try and complete that question. Um, how much to trust with what? Right, when you're designing defenses, it's really important to keep in mind whom you're defending against, right? 
uh, are you worried that they will uh, delete your money, so to speak? Probably not. Um, are you worried they'll give all your data to the, say, the Indian government so that uh, they can track all of the transactions you're making? They probably will. Um, so it, it really depends on what you're worried about. Um, right. What is probably not going to happen is that it's probably not going to be the case that we will have large scale surveillance of the type that happens routinely, say, in China. Right. If you've heard of their social credit system where they're tracking payments and what kinds of things you say, and accordingly you get a social credit score that decides, let's say, whether you can get on trains or not, that sort of thing, I think, luckily, we are very, very far away from that in India. Right. Um, our next question is from uh, Priyanshu Nagar who asks, it's actually quite a relevant question. He says, um, it has been said that the Zoom app is not secure. So what type of um, security or privacy problem was there? So there were a lot, right? Um, and I don't really blame Zoom for it so much. I think this is, this is something that happens with many startups, right? Yeah. You're designing something, you want the stupid thing to just work, right? And then you think about security and you add some security on top. Um, the kind of security they had added was not very good. It also allowed, uh, the, they also didn't have passwords on by default and things like that. Mm -hmm. So what it meant was, uh, say, I think this happened in Singapore. So, you know, you, you, you had a classroom going on. And of course, the children in the classroom, they had just shared that link willy nilly with all sorts of people. Mm -hmm. And then those links had spread and you had random people coming in and, you know, doing vulgar things, let's say, on camera. Um, so you had a lot of these sort of Zoom bombing style attacks that were occurring. Um, and that's a very real problem. It's sort of beyond Zoom. Uh, but they have started putting in a lot of protections to prevent that sort of thing. You, you might have noticed they've activated waiting rooms and stuff like that. Um, there are protections you can put. They were also eminently hackable until recently. Uh, they've, they've just updated their software. I don't know what the latest stuff is, but until very recently, they, they, they were doing some pretty stupid things with their cryptography. Oh, um, our next question is from um, Vishal Tripathi. And uh, ooh, this is something I'd also like to know about. He says, um, could you shed some light on how quantum physics has a bearing on uh, cryptography? Ooh, difficult question. So uh, I, I'll try and summarize this. Um, quantum computation allows us to do some really, really interesting things. Right? I won't go into how it does it, but it allows us to do certain kinds of computations very, very quickly. Um, essentially, instead of writing programs in the normal procedural way, what you're doing is dealing with distributions of inputs and you're combining them in, in some sort of clever fashion so that your output probability distribution has a spike in the place of the correct answer in all conditions. That's essentially what you're trying to do. Right? Um, and maybe we can do a lecture on that later on. But uh, it turns out that there are quantum algorithms that allow you to do to solve a particular problem. It's called Shor's algorithm, and it allows you to uh, do something that sounds really stupid, factorize integers. Given a large integer, can I break it down into its prime factors? Now, yeah. as it turns out, there are a number of encryption schemes, such as RSA, which is one of the most common ones, um, and some many signature algorithms, uh, digital signatures, that depend on this thing at the end of the day, right? That depend on the idea that it takes a very long time, that it is infeasible for a normal computer to take a very large number and break it down into its prime factors. Now, because quanta, a quantum computer could do that fairly quickly, mm -hmm. um, those kinds of encryption would be assumed to be broken. Now, fortunately for us, we have many, many, many new kinds of encryption that are quantum resistant. Uh, Lattice-based encryption is a very powerful form that allows us to do many interesting things, including the kind of, uh, you saw that thing with the calculator, you remember that? Uh, that's a certain kind of something called homomorphic encryption. Uh, that's what we use that for usually, but it also turns out that we can make quantum resistance systems from there. Right, I see. So we're well, well protected quite far into the future. Right. 
Um, so our next question is from an anonymous person again, and they ask, uh, to what extent are individuals who save their passwords or account login details on their electronic devices at risk um, uh, for having their privacy violated? I mean, how can we encrypt a digital structure? Uh, sorry, a digital um, signature. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to do the same thing I did in the, in the other two questions. Mm -hmm. From whom? Right? Uh, now, uh, most browsers actually are okay. Uh, mm -hmm. If you store it on uh, a browser, if you just save your password there with especially some sort of master password, it's mm -hmm. usually kind of okay. As long, of course, as long as of course you don't share your master password with other people, yeah. right? Um, I've seen a lot of people say in my father's offices and stuff like that uh, do things like, "Oh, we'll and our own offices in many place, cases, um, they'll just write down passwords on a post-it note or on a piece of paper or in a text file on their desktop and just stick it somewhere." Because you know, all of these organizations have all these complicated policies. They want numbers, they want capital letters, mm -hmm. underscore this, that, and the other. Um, and actually, one of my students, a couple of my students, and I are working on this difference between actual security and effective security, right? Uh, sorry, uh, assumed security and effective security. So, your assumed security is, oh, I have all of these hashes and special characters. And the effective security is, no, you don't. Guess what? People are just writing it down. And that might protect you quite well from someone far away trying to hack into your system. It doesn't protect you from, say, uh, an irritated sibling, right? Um, so it really depends on what you're defending against. And depending on those scenarios, I strongly recommend, as I always do, the Mozilla Foundation and the EFF, the Electronic Found Frontier Foundation. Um, they, they provide a lot of uh, data and detailed tutorials on how to do this stuff properly. Right, but again, you always have to be careful about whom you are defending against. Right. So, um, so we're sort of running out of time. So we'll take our last two questions. Um, Hireshwar Vetri and um, Vishnu Varadrajan ask, um, how did the Enigma machine of World War II work? Oh, great question. Um, so I can't give you a detailed description, but I can tell you a basic version of what it was doing. So it was a rotor-based machine. Um, so you can imagine a gear um, with, uh, in, at each cog, imagine there is something that transmits electricity, right? It wasn't actually this, but just imagine for now. Um, and imagine you're stacking a bunch of gears one after the other, right? And each gear has A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H written on it on each cog in a different order. Mm -hmm. Now, as you turn these gears in different configurations, uh, you know, E is going to conduct to a completely different thing on the other end, right? That's essentially what it was doing. Right, I see. Yeah, I remember reading about this many years ago and I got very interested in it. So I think Alan Turing's biography must be somewhere on my bookshelf. <laughs> I found it very interesting. Um, so we'll take our last question for tonight from uh, Bhavesh Nikra. Um, they ask, isn't privacy a matter of privilege? How many people even understand and care about these? And can we do something about it? What policy and mechanisms can be employed? That's a super long question. I'm not sure I can answer in a minute, but I'll try. Um, I'll say, yes, it is. And no, it shouldn't be. Privacy okay. should not be the prerogative of the rich. Um, mainly because unlike many other things that we give away, privacy is something that you can never get back. If Facebook has all your data, you're never getting it back, I assure you, right? Okay. So uh, imagine someone who is poor, does that mean that that person does not deserve to have a modicum of privacy? Should it be the case that all of their details are traded by companies across the world for their profit? Um, I don't think so. And that's a very strong moral stand I hope to communicate to all of the people listening. Yeah. Um, and there are people who are working very hard at getting it through, but it really requires quite a bit of education. It's almost like education and hygiene, yeah. right? Just like we have physical hygiene, which we're suddenly a lot more aware of now due to COVID. Um, I think cyber hygiene is going to become more and more important as we go along. Right. 
Well, uh, sir, I'm afraid we're out of time. So thank you very much for today's session. You'll be glad to know that we had over 240 participants and over 100 questions. So thank you very much. It's been very, it's been really nice. Thank you, Rashmi, for having me. And thank you, Scientifically Speaking. Take care and have a great night. Yeah, thank you, sir. Good night. So um, as a conclusion to Pro uh, Professor Debayan's informative session, we have a short quiz to test your knowledge. Remember the top five winners will get very exciting hampers, so please stick around. On the chat feature, we've sent a link to a Google form. You can click on that and the uh, quiz will close two minutes after the seminar closes. Um, all names of the quiz winners will be up on Ashoka's website, so check it out on ashoka.edu.in. On behalf of Ashoka University, I'd like to thank all our participants for joining us for the fifth lecture of Scientifically Speaking. We hope that you've enjoyed the session. Um, we would greatly appreciate your feedback for this seminar, so please fill in the survey that will pop up on your screen when you leave the lecture. It will only take about 30 seconds, so, and it will really help us improve on um, future seminars. Follow Ashoka University on Instagram and Facebook for updates on the next lecture. Thank you once again for your time. Have a great week ahead and see you next Tuesday to engage in Scientifically Speaking again. Thank you very much and good night.